A message from the Galactic Federation of Worlds on the Iran-Israel conflict. Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet releases a report on underwater UFOs. NASA Astrobiology Workshop discusses announcing the discovery of extraterrestrial life. Biden administration officials Jake Sullivan and Lloyd Austin shut down any prospects for the passage of the UAP Disclosure Act due to election year concerns. Sweden and Switzerland just signed the Artemis Accords, expanding it to 38 countries. These and more stories on Exopolitics Today, the Week in Review. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome to Exopolitics Today, the week in review for April 20. Uh, I don't have as many stories to cover this week, so this hopefully will be a shorter one. So I just did a interview on the Greg Reese show where I discussed my background and thoughts on a number of exopolitics uh, topics. So I just tweeted the link to that. It's just an audio only. So if those of you that are interested in listening to an audio uh, interview featuring me and my background and my thoughts on exopolitics, you can uh, listen to that on the Reese Report. The link is in my Twitter feed. So this is the story that really got a lot of people's attention and is very topical. And that is a message from the Galactic Federation of Worlds on the Israel-Iran conflict. So this was uh, a message that I received uh, from Elena Danan that was relayed by her from Thorhan Aredjan. Uh, For those that have not been following Elena Danan's work, she is in touch with a... Uh, well, actually, several extraterrestrial organizations. Uh, One of them is the Galactic Federation of Worlds, and her principal contact in that is a Palladian uh, by the name of Thorhan Aredian. And uh, sometimes uh, he uh, passes on a message intended for me uh, through her, or I have been able to ask him questions that Elena kindly relays to him. So in this case, he relayed a question, to, a, a an update to me about the uh, recent events in Iran and uh, Israel uh, that led uh, a week ago to the Iranian attack on Israel that really concerned a lot of people, thinking that, well, would this trigger a third world war, and um, as at this time, Israel did respond in a limited fashion, but in a way that Iran uh, could dismiss as uh, actually some kind of infiltration as opposed to an attack from Israel. So Israel launched its retaliation to Iran's retaliation. And and what, what is clear in terms of the Iran retaliation to Israel's attack on April 1st on the Iranian embassy compound in Damascus, Syria, that it, Iran retaliated uh, on April 8th. And uh, yesterday, uh, Iran, sorry, uh, Iran was attacked. Uh, Israel attacked Iran and that was also a limited attack. In in both cases, in these two retaliations, uh, what is clear is that these were were things that were worked out in behind-the-scenes negotiations so that the country launching the attack uh, made sure not to go too far in terms of what they targeted, uh, made sure that they avoided civilian deaths. And that was something that was like agreed in advance uh, between uh, the US and representatives of that country. So uh, for Iran's retaliation, uh, you had US representatives discussing with uh, Iranian Iranians through an intermediary 
how Iran uh, could attack in a way that would not trigger a massive Israeli response. And similarly, the Israelis, uh, they were also coached in how to respond to Iran's unprecedented attack on uh, Israeli territory with their own attack on Iranian territory without themselves triggering a massive response. So for those that are watching this, what we are witnessing at the moment is that uh, uh, Israel and Iran are, are trading kind of retaliatory strikes, but staying within firm limits. Now, according to this message from Thorham, what he is saying is that the White Hats, along with the Earth Alliance and the Galactic Federation, are working things out behind the scenes so that these retaliations can be done in a way that will not lead to a massive strike back that would lead to a wider regional war because that seems to be something that the White Hats want to ensure doesn't happen, that this trading of strikes between Israel and Iran doesn't escalate to where there's a direct confrontation uh, between Israel and Iran where you know, they go full bore into a war and which sucks in uh, the US uh, and Russia. Uh, and so it seems that there is a lot of effort being done behind the scenes to prevent that from happening. And so far it looks like that is succeeding because what we saw with um Iran's, sorry, uh, with Israel's retaliation on April 19 to, uh, to Iran, that it was done in a way that the Iranians could say, oh, well, you know, this was actually not an external attack at all. It was infiltration. Someone got into the country and launched some drones, but we shot them all down. No, no problem. And so, and so the, the conflict at the moment looks like it is being managed. And this is a good thing because what Thorhan is saying or said in his message is that the deep state uh, desperately wants to create a war, that they would rather have the earth being engulfed by a war rather than surrender, rather than watch their power uh, get frittered away as they are exposed. So, so this is actually a good thing that this conflict is being managed behind the scenes so that the White Hats from all the different sides are working it out so that nothing escalates into a regional war. So I, I think so far uh, we can, uh, fingers crossed, hope that uh, things do not escalate and that uh, it is managed because I, I suspect that when a war does not break in the in the region, uh, that that will pretty much spell the end of the deep state because I think this was probably their last best shot at creating a, a major regional war, if not a third world war. And that, that is something they, they tried to do in Ukraine and, and failed to do. And they cre tried to create a civil war in the United States and they failed to do that. Now they're trying to create a war, a new Middle East war, and they're going to fail in that. And, and that means that the deep state's power base is being frittered away. And, and this relates to a disclosure plan that Thorhan Eredian delivered to the head of US Northern Command back in January of 2023. And while we don't know the contents of that disclosure plan, I, I think it probably has within it uh, something along the lines of what we are witnessing now, that any major conflicts that could escalate into a world war are contained in a way where both sides can let off a bit of steam by saying, oh, yeah, you know, we retaliated, we we hit them hard and gave them a bloody nose, and, and that's it. Everyone walks away because no one, no one really wants a war other than the deep state. Okay, so here is a, a Fox News article that discusses a Seoul Foundation report by retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet about the importance of underwater 
uh, UFOs or UAPs as they call them, also known as uh, Unidentified Submersible Objects or USOs. So this report by uh, Admiral Gallaudet, I, I thought it was well done in terms of presenting the kind of some of the history of uh, USO reports, uh, some of the theories behind them. So it gives an overview of them and points out that, you know, we don't know what these are, that a lot of what we know about the ocean floor is actually classified information. So I think that's kind of hinting that, yes, uh, uh, the Navy knows what's down there, but it's classified. They're not, they're not, not letting you know. Um, but uh, we can get a fair idea by looking at historical reports. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, so that was his conclusion that, yeah, we can look at the available public data and get an idea of underwater UFOs. There are some witnesses uh, that have talked about it, and but most of the information is still classified. So what I thought was well worth pointing out was that while according to official records or declassified records, FOIA records, uh, reports by whistleblowers and so forth about underwater UFOs, you can kind of get an overview of, okay, there are UFOs flying here. I mean, who's piloting these things? I mean, who's behind it? Uh, that's where you really need to look at, one, historical records, and two, people that have been on the craft or, or being taken to locations where these craft emanate from. So, for example, we, we've got to look at, say, uh, Babylonian legends about uh, the sea gods, such as uh, Uh There's also Phoenician records about a sea god called Dagon. So in both of those cases and many other cases around the world, these ancient historical records talk about these sea gods, beings coming out of the oceans, Oanus, Dagon, Enki, that these beings came out of the ocean and shared advanced technology with humans, shared wisdom, shared the arts, culture, and so forth. So what we get from ancient historical records is that uh, there are benevolent beings from under the oceans that have shared uh, advanced knowledge and wisdom technology with uh, surface humans at times when surface humanity is, is still trying to develop civilization. Now, the other source are people that have actually been taken on these uh, USOs or have uh, witnessed where the USOs are coming from. And, and there are two people that I've been interviewing uh, fairly regularly. One is uh, JP. Uh, who's currently serving with the U.S. Army? He's been taken. He was taken once to an underwater uh, city complex in the Bermuda Triangle, where he saw three fabulous cities or three cities under domes. Each one, each dome had a city or kind of a metropolitan area within it, and they were connected by big glass tubes. And so he was taken there on a mission and saw that. Now, what's interesting is that another one of the people or the whistleblowers, or actually he's more correct to call him a witness, is Jean-Charles Moyen. And he describes how when he was 10 years old, he was taken to a, an underwater complex. He described it as three kind of hemisphere-shaped ships that were connected by tubes. Uh, also in the Bermuda Triangle area. So very similar descriptions of what is very likely the same underwater city complex in the Bermuda Triangle hosting these advanced humans. And JP was taken there on one of the craft of these uh, these the civilization, the underwater civilization, and he described it as a kind of advanced submarine looking craft so those are two witnesses and so i think if we really want to know what's going on with underwater ufos 
you know, we've got to look at all of the available data, the witness sightings, the, the photos, the videos, FOIA documents that uh, Admiral Golodet released. But to get a complete picture, you know, we need to start considering the testimonies of people that have been taken on these crafts. And this is one of the big weaknesses, unfortunately, with conventional ufology going all the way back to the 1950s with George Adamski is that ufologists are very reluctant to consider the testimonies of people that say we were taken on the craft and this is what we saw on the craft, on the UFO and describe the inhabitants and the technologies they had and the philosophies they shared. Uh, conventional UFO researchers have not wanted to look at that for different reasons. I think their main reason is that they, they want to be considered credible by a, a wider sceptical uh, society. Uh, so they ref they don't go there. They just don't want to interview contactees. They don't want to give people who have actually been taken on these craft kind of serious attention and consideration because they feel that if they do, they lose credibility. Now, I look at it all and say, well, if you really want to understand the big picture, I mean, you've got to look at the people that have that have been taken on the craft, that have interacted with the occupants of the craft. I mean, if you just look at the, if you just take photos of the craft as they're kind of entering and leaving the ocean and that's it and you say, well, you know, this is science and we've got photographs and we want to study those and, you know, we're not interested in someone who says he was on that craft that we photographed that went into the ocean and that person comes out and says, oh, yeah, I went down there and there's this great city and incredible technologies and, uh, you know, beautiful people and all of that. And your photo researchers say, no, that's all just anecdotal. We don't want to hear any of that. So that's, I mean, that is a very unfortunate and uh, and if, if we want the big picture, we need to start considering witness testimonies, people who have actually been on these craft. Okay, here's, uh, okay, so the, the next Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection Conference runs from September 27 to 29 in Denver, Colorado. So this is an opportunity for those that want to hear some firsthand witness testimonies of people who have been taken on underwater craft or have been taken into underground civilizations or off-planet bases or spacecraft, this is the place to come because this is really the uh, the premier extraterrestrial contactee event in, in the United States. I mean, there is a contact in the desert event. I've been to it several times, but uh, <laughs> they don't really interview a lot of contactees. Um, it's more UFO researchers doing, you know, doing their stuff in terms of examining photos and so forth. Okay, so JP, uh, he has a YouTube channel. And on his YouTube channel, sometimes he will uh, release a video of something that he experienced in one of the reports that he has shared with me. So I do these regular updates with uh, JP where he shares a mission uh, report with me and I release it. And what JP has decided to do is that he's opened up uh, an Instagram account. Uh, he's He's got a YouTube channel and also a Twitter account as well. They, those are all linked on my web page, on my home page. Uh, for JP. I do have a page for JP. You can go to the website there and um, under resources, you'll find JP page. So he's got a YouTube channel. And so on this YouTube channel, he will occasionally release a video where he tries to give some graphics. He uses some, um, say, some narration, but always tries to, in his own words, describe more details about some of the things that he experienced and that he described in the updates with me. So this is a great way if you just want to get more information and if or, or another perspective or JP just reflecting on the significance of, of his missions and his experiences, uh, you can go to his YouTube channel and subscribe and, and watch the reports. They're, they're for free and he does actually do pr provide um, subtitles in Portuguese and Spanish, which is a nice motivation. Okay, so here is a 
recent NASA astrobiology workshop that was held featuring scientists, researchers, and, and journalists discussing how to announce the discovery of extraterrestrial life. So this came out in Scientific American. And so that means that this is what the establishment wants scientists to consider. They, they want scientists to start thinking about, well, if alien life is found, how should scientists break the news? And so the, in this NASA workshop, they discussed previous attempts to dis uh, announce the discovery of extraterrestrial life that, that failed. So, for example, the 1976 Viking mission that showed uh, the experiments or showed the results of two experiments on Viking landers, which presumably showed the existence of organic life on Mars. And, and those experiments then got kind of like uh, redone in a way to come up with a null result, result. And so there was a lot of controversy. Then during the Clinton administration, you had a meteorite landing. And uh, during the Clinton administration, an announcement was made that uh, there was life, uh, microbi microbiological life, on this meteorite, again, another controversy that didn't really take off. There was no announcement. So they, they went through those examples and discussed exactly what and how to release uh, information or data showing that extraterrestrial life had been has been discovered. So that's very important because I think any day now we're probably going to have an announcement from the James Webb Space Telescope that they have found biosignatures on some distant planet, proving that microbial life exists on some exoplanet. And I think scientists are getting ready for that. Scientific American is telling this, uh, you know, the scientific community to uh, get their heads out of the sand. Uh, it's time to start taking this information seriously. So that's a that's a good thing. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I did an interview with a, an investigative filmmaker, uh, Darcy Weir, and I, I was very impressed by uh, Darcy's dedication to putting out a lot of videos dealing with the UFO topic. Uh, he began in 2012. He was inspired by the Phil Schneider story, and, and because, because of that story, he was then inspired to go deeper into this whole phenomenon of uh, UFOs, underground bases, secret space programs, non-human intelligence, and so forth. He kind of tries, it, it tries to take a middle ground approach, which is to pitch it in, pitch the information in a way that uh, a wider audience will find it acceptable. So some people say, well, Darcy didn't go far enough and, and he was like sceptical of some of Phil Schneider's claims. I think, I think what Darcy is really trying to do here is to really appeal to a wider audience that, look, this stuff is real. You need to look into it. You need to study it. Uh, there, there's a lot here and, and go into it without alienating people from the get-go and, and just presenting all this information as true and uh, presenting in a more kind of objective way as something worth ex exploration. So, uh, yeah, he's definitely done quite a few videos. He's got his own website, uh, occultjourneys.com, and uh, definitely, yeah, he talks about UFOs, underwater uh, UFOs, USOs. He's done uh, videos or documentaries on Sasquatch. So definitely... Uh, I think uh, he's doing a lot of good work in preparing the general public for what's coming. For those that have been studying this phenomenon uh, for decades, you might find that the, the information is not new. But, of course, for those, uh, especially scientists, that are now being told by Scientific American that, well, you've got to take this stuff seriously, I think Darcy Weir's uh, videos are actually very good and, and nice gifts for people. Okay, so here's a claim uh, a condor man i'm not sure who that is uh here there he is he's an aerospace engineer so condor man's an aerospace engineer he says that uh he knows a colonel he had a chat with a colonel and the, and the colonel told him well what the condor man said was i can't believe we went from the schumer amendment to the whitewashed 
error report. What went wrong? Now, according to this colonel, uh, Jake Sullivan, that is the national security advisor for Joe Biden, uh, and Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, that they shut it down. Uh, apparently, they didn't want Biden being asked about UAPs during an election, a, a tight election year. So, that, so I thought that was very, very interesting. That uh, that UAP disclosure act for 2023 that was gutted, and all that resulted was that they created a. UAP records collection in the National Archives, that that was shut down uh, because uh, Joe Biden's uh, key officials wanted to ensure that he would not be asked awkward questions during an election year, which I find uh, uh, very sad um, if that's if that's correct. Uh, but uh, yeah, nothing surprises me now when it comes to this Biden administration. So here we have this declassified Kona Blue document that shows that the UFO issue was taken seriously by the Department of Homeland Security, but it never got access to re retrieved alien technology. So here's a story in um, msn.com. Uh, it describes what was the Kona Bl Blue program, because now if you go to the arrow, that's the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office website. Uh, they have a list of declassified documents, and you'll find this on their website. And it's a Homeland Security uh, document uh, that concerns what was uh, described as a, I think it was a, a prospective special access program. So uh, this is something, special access programs are, are compartmentalized programs that, deal with classified topics within the um, Department of Defense. And because this was a perspective, I guess they were trying to uh, get funding and to get other national organizations to sign off on this perspective uh, special access program so that the Department of Homeland Security could get, could get access to some retrieved alien technologies and therefore come up with some kind of determination as to whether or not these technologies could be successfully reverse engineered and so forth. Now, according to the Kona Blue do uh, document, this initiative uh, failed. It, it, didn't, it didn't get funding and it was eventually shut down because it failed to get access to these technologies. And what that tells us is that essentially the Department of Homeland Security, uh, they were denied access by the entities, a lot of them within the intelligence community, that do know or are conducting these programs. So the Department of Homeland Security could have gone, for example, ask the CIA or the NSA or the Department of Energies or it, whether it's a an intelligence department or, or whether it's a uh, a department of defense entity or like the Dep department of energy a separate agency and say so, well we, we, we want to get access to any files you have concerning crashed ufo craft because we want to un understand what these are and conduct the feasibility study on these things being re successfully reverse engineered. And so the uh, Department of Energy, the NSA, the CIA, the uh, in, in the Office of Naval Intelligence, uh, they probably told the Homeland Security to take a hike. And so in a way, what happened was not that dissimilar to the case with the FBI in the 1940s and 1950s, according to leaked documents, we know that the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover did try to get access to classified UFO files and were denied access. And so these released files show uh, the director Hoover uh, you know, being very upset about this. And so I think the same thing happened to the Department of Homeland Security. You know, those agencies and departments and corporations that do have access to this type of technology just said, 
uh, nope, not, nothing to see here, move on, <laughs> and then that's it. So Department of Homeland Security decided to shut it down, and, and this shutdown program is now being released because in the verbiage in the document, it makes it out that, well, there was no evidence of any retrieved craft with any kind of uh, technology that could be studied and reverse engineered. No evidence of any of that. Well, what that's really saying is that the Department of Homeland Security uh, were not given anything by those agencies or those departments that do have this information. Okay, here's our news about uh, Sweden and Switzerland just signing the Artemis Accords, expanding it to 38 countries. So the Artemis Accords have really taken off. 38 countries have now signed these bilateral accords with the United States, NASA in particular, on space cooperation. And what this does is it lays the foundation for the United States overseeing the coordinated space activities of all 38 signatory countries. So you can imagine all major uh, European world spacefaring uh, countries are now on board except for Russia, China, uh, North Korea, uh, I believe Iran and, uh, and uh, another four. I think there's, uh, there's nine that belong to the rival uh, Lunar Research Station initiative that was launched by China and Russia uh, as a rival to the Artemis Accords. But they've only got nine countries signing up. The Artemis Accords have 38, and Sweden and Switzerland have become the, the latest um, to sign up. And what this does is effectively creates a coordinated civilian effort to explore and exploit space. And that is going to be supported by a military side, a military aspect of that, where the bigger countries, we're talking about, the, say, the, you know, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Australia, uh, those countries that actually have space commands, that actually have functional, well-equipped military space commands, that they are collaborating it's actually called the combined space operations initiative and that is the hub or the nucleus for what will be a future space nato or a starfleet now whether they actually use the word starfleet we don't know but what we do know is that in 2019 there was a space futures workshop held at peterson air force base in denver or in Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, and that chose a Star Trek future as the optimal scenario to be created uh, over the next uh, 40 years, so that by 2060, what uh, the US and its major uh, military allies want to do is to create a Star Trek future. So the Artemis Accords are the civilian side of that, and you have this combined space operations initiative, which is going to grow uh, into something like a Starfleet over the years ahead. So that that is exciting for for those of us that were brought up on Star Trek. That uh, this is actually happening. It's unfolding very slowly at the moment. The foundations are being set, but I think once the uh, disclosures start happening things are going to move really, really fast because I, I believe that we already have a Star Trek future, that there already is a multinational military that is operating in space under the leadership of the US Navy, which is called Solar Warden. Uh, but that has not been disclosed and will not be disclosed until uh, the political and social infrastructure has been set up on, on Earth, and that's where we need to have uh, UFO disclosure. Okay, so here's... Uh, an article uh, by Christopher Sharp in his or in the Liberation Times website about a newly released batch of FOIA documents concerning whistleblower testimonies about UFOs. Now, it's very nuanced, so you'll need to kind of spend a little bit of time understanding the nuances here. But according to these FOIA documents, David Grush and other whistleblowers 
believed that there were significant security flaws in the ARA officers' uh, procedures that uh, Grush and others that were wanting to testify to the ARA office, in their dealings with the ARA office, they found that there was, there was a lack in sufficient security protocols so that if they disclosed some of what they knew about uh, special access programs dealing with UFOs, that that could have actually uh, threatened national security. Uh, that's essentially what they were saying. Uh, especially when it came to programs within the intelligence community. So what, what this document tells us is kind of like a similar situation to what happened with Kona Blue um, and the Department of Homeland Security, is that a lot of these programs are occurring within the intelligence community, that they, they have their own procedures, uh, special access program procedures. They call it a controlled access program within the intelligence community. And so they have their own protocols and they can choose who they release those to and the Department of Defence uh, cannot compel the intelligence community to release any documents. So that means that the Arrow office has no way of being able to get documents from the intelligence community. So this is where the nuances come in that Grush and and others said that there was some kind of conflict here, some problem in terms of working out the security protocols for them sharing information about a, um, a say, controlled access program within the intelligence community, that there were problems and that they didn't feel comfortable sharing that information with the Arrow Office. So at the end of the day, it seems that the Arrow Office may not, after all, have heard that much from whistleblowers like David Grush. So when the Arrow report came out saying we found no significant evidence, uh, what that tells us is that the whistleblowers they did speak to did something along the lines of what Grush did, which is that, well, I, I know of some of these programs, but if I'm going to talk about it, that there are these security protocols that need to be met. And because the Arrow office couldn't meet those security protocols, which concerned the intelligence community, as opposed to the Department of Defense or the Pentagon, then the the kind of um, the, the the really juicy information wasn't released. So very interesting article. So that really is all that I'm going to be covering for this uh, week in review. Uh, just remember, on May four, I have an upcoming uh, webinar which is going to be on. Uh, Russia's secret space program and so I will be diving into the history of that what its relevance is today and and look at the role Russia is playing behind the scenes to res resolve these conflicts uh, in the Middle East in particular to try and bring about a peaceful resolution manage these these conflicts in a way that don't erupt into a regional conflagration that, that Russia is actually playing a very positive role in that regard. So I'll be talking about that in my May 4 webinar. If you want to find out more about that, just go to exopolitics.org. So that's it for this uh, week. So thank you for uh, watching and don't forget to uh, like, share and subscribe to this podcast. That really helps the uh, this information get out to a wider audience. So thank you all and aloha. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.